Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Well done for all getting out of bed this morning. When I looked at the conference schedule and realised that I would be talking on Saturday morning after the dinner, I was a bit apprehensive. So well done for all dragging yourselves out of bed. Well, here you go. My name is Dominic Kendrick. I work as a software developer at The Guardian. And today we're going to be talking about analytics. Um, so, I'm Dominic. I've been working in software development for about 10 years. Um, I've been at The Guardian for about two and a half years as a senior software developer and a developer manager. Uh, I worked at Amnesty International prior to that for about five years as a tech lead and then in various agencies before that. So I'm not telling you this just to kind of blow my own trumpet. It's really to support this one sad fact that for at least 50% of my career, I have not really known what I'm doing. <laughs> Pretty straightforward. So, that's not that I don't know how to code. Coding is relatively straightforward. Um, it's not that I didn't have a clear understanding of the feature that I was supposed to build. There was functional specs and all these things. So this stuff was relatively straightforward. But what I didn't know is why the business actually wanted me to build these features and what the outcome they expected was. So this is kind of crazy. So what I'm going to be doing is I'll be spending the next half an hour talking to you about why you should be putting analytics at the heart of your process. So that's the aim of this presentation, is to convince you to put analytics at the heart of your development process. First of all, I'm going to talk about why you should do this. It will be pretty obvious to you then. Um, then I'm going to talk about how it's going to change your process, so what you should probably be doing differently, unless you're doing it already. Um, the best way to get data, so the types of systems you can use for collecting information and giving it back to people who need it. Um, then who it's for, like who actually do you need to collect data for in your organisation. Um, and then some examples where it's worked well and where I've used it and also bits where it doesn't always apply and hasn't worked as well. And then there'll be time for some questions at the end. So, let us begin. Number one, why should I put analytics at the heart of my process? Well, do you know what? If you haven't done this, you're wasting time and money. Everyone knows that development is pretty expensive. I worked out that the average, in fact, the minimum amount you can spend on a developer per day is about £300. That's 100 pints of beer a day that you are pouring away. <laughs> Anybody want a breakfast beer? <laughs> That's a lot of money to be wasting if you're not doing the right thing. Number two, if you can't measure success, then how do you know if you've ever reached it? You can be... You can have great designs, you can have great wireframes, and you can have a good specification. But if you don't know what you're aiming for, you're just stabbing repeatedly in the dark, hoping that this feature has actually made some good. So, thirdly, if your team doesn't know what it's doing, so you haven't told your developers why you're doing this, then really you're kind of constraining yourselves. So, everyone had one of these before? List of features telling you what to do. This is the one biggest constraint that you have as a developer, that is telling you exactly what you should be doing, not why you should be doing it, and it doesn't allow you to use this beautiful mind that you have in your head to think of different possibilities and think of different outcomes. If someone has predetermined the outcome of what you're doing, there is no creativity and no scope for change. And they've pretty much bet all of their money that that idea that they had at the beginning is going to be good. We don't sit there typing with one hand behind our back because we think it's fun. We use all hands and all fingers. So you should also be using all of your team to actually utilise this and think about solving the problems for your organisation. Developers aren't just there to write code. Um, thirdly, fourthly, what are we on? Five for number four. Release cycles, the whole point of Agile, what we've been trying to drum into ourselves over the years, is that we want to be able to release software quickly. We have gone from three-month release cycles to two-week release cycles, and now if you're really cool, you've probably gone to daily release cycles and some type of continuous deployment. If not, you should. Um, but if you don't have the data to support getting the feedback out of your systems when you're releasing that quickly, all this is a waste of time. So, it's good for your wallet, it's good for your team, and also it's good for your clients, because you're actually see, focusing on the outcome that they want. Wonderful. So, moving on. The next question, how would analytics change my process? So what do I need to be doing differently that I'm not doing today? Well, do you know what? It's going to change your process <coughs> fundamentally unless you're already doing this. So the first thing we have to realise is that every single idea that you've come is just that. It's only an idea. Um, it's not a fact, and it doesn't mean anything. Like the piano necktie 
the self-wiping toilet seat, and probably PHP. These things seemed good at the time, but you know, they need to be validated in the real world. So what's the point of this? So the first thing you need to do is take this idea and form a hypothesis. That means not only what you're going to do, but what you expect the outcome to be at the end. Um, I'm going to have an example feature, not an example. This is something I was asked to do a couple of months ago. So in The Guardian, we have a registration process. People can register The Guardian. Um, and someone, they wanted to add a telephone number to this. So they were like, Dom, add the telephone number. So, OK, there you go. I can type away and add the telephone number. But that's only one half the equation. What was the value in adding this telephone number? What really did they want? So it wasn't just about storing these extra digits about somebody. There was actually an outcome that someone had in their mind when they made this request. So the hypothesis isn't just, we want to store the telephone number. The hypothesis is, by adding a telephone number to the registration field, we will be able to market to people via SMS, potentially. Um, and then we will be able to increase the amount of traffic that comes from those types of devices. So you've gone from an idea to actually a hypothesis. And that's really going to change the approach that I take to writing the code and what I'm going to do. Because it doesn't mean that I'm just sitting there and um, implementing a telephone number. There's going to be a whole lot of tracking that I need to put in. So I need to work out how many people are actually going to give me this information. Has it actually increased the number of referrals from mobile devices? Because that is the goal, not just adding the telephone number. That's a step in that direction. So step number two, you've formed your hypothesis. You've worked out kind of the change you want to make, or at least the outcome that you want to have. The next thing, the minimum viable product. What is the easiest way to prove and track this idea? So this constraint of the hypothesis allows you to focus a lot more in what you think you should be implementing and how you're actually going to prove that this is right. So then this is what you should be focusing your software on, not adding the telephone number, but proving that this is a valuable thing to your organization and business and do that. So we're going to make sure that we've written the code to store the number in the database, but we've also got the right tracking in place, not only to see how many people supply us this information, but also how many people come back from those channels to see if the hypothesis was actually true. Thirdly, you want to release this into production ASAP. This is why you have these fast deploy cycles, is so you can prove this thing as quickly as possible. The longer you don't prove a hypothesis and go blindly away building these features, the more risk you have as a business. So this is a purely risk reduction strategy. You don't want to spend months or years building a piece of software if you haven't actually tried it out. So this is all about getting it into production quickly and trying it out. So let's imagine, what are the various outcomes that we could have with this telephone number? Well, it could be a successful outcome. Suddenly, the users are flocking to give us their telephone numbers. Um, so we can market that channel, and it's extremely successful. This proves that the hypothesis was correct. But there's other things that might not go so well. If we made it a required field, maybe people don't want to part with that information. They don't want to give us the telephone number. Registrations drop. Sad face. You could make it optional. People don't necessarily have to give you that number. That may be a good indication to see how many people want to do it or not. So there's various outcomes that you can have. It's not always going to be successful. Um, and in fact, most of the time, it's not going to be successful. This is why we have to iterate so quickly to try and do this. Validating your success criteria. You've made your hypothesis. I want to increase the number of people that visit my site via SMS out through this marketing channel. The next thing you need to do is make sure that that's actually true. So have you got the tracking in place to do that? Can you prove that you have got more people coming from this channel? Um, finally, you have to also re-evaluate your site often. So do you have features that are not doing what they should be doing? They're not performing as well as expected. As Richard Branson once said, complexity is your enemy. So you don't want to have too much complexity in your site because it's hard. Any Muppet can make a complex site just by plowing in the features. Simplicity is the real art. So making sure your site does exactly what it is means it's efficient and you're not wasting people's time by making make too many decisions. So let me recap so you can all process this information again. Number one, form a hypothesis from your idea and work out what your success criteria is. Only then should you decide how you should build your features and where you should work to. Work out the scope for your um, testing that you're going to do from the hypothesis. So this should be a constraining tool that allows you to work out the smallest thing you need to do to prove that this is correct. Um, finally, make sure you've got systems to be able to track the result of this change. Um, four, and this is what I should not re cannot reiterate enough, is that your feature is not complete. It's not done when it's in production. 
it's done when it's successful. That's the true definition of done, that you have decided what you want to do and you've actually made it happen. But pushing it to production is an intermediary step on the road to success. And you should be re-evaluating your site often. Are the features you've got on your site the most optimal and are they doing the best thing? Well done. I don't think I'm going to drink any of that beer. I should have brought some water up here. There you go. So, next. This all sounds like a great idea. You are all on board with what I am saying. Um, next, what is the best way to get data? How, how can you do this? Well, do you know what? Any way you can. It doesn't, you don't have to use Google Analytics. You've got a whole plethora of choices to get hold of this data because this is the most valuable thing to be able to iterate on your site and prove that what you're doing is successful. So I'm going to take, uh, this is an agile talk, but there will be some few technical bits that we're going to be going through. The first one is actually how an analytics system works. So a lot of people are kind of mystified. They're just like, I drop a bit of JavaScript code on my page and then bam, Google makes the magic happen. Actually, it's relatively straightforward. The first thing we're going to look at is the payload. So when, you, when you're building an analytics system, what type of information are you sending off to this third party and how can you use that to influence and set up your tracking correctly. So this is an example payload of what you might send to an analytics system. So the first thing is the type of event you're sending. So when someone registers <coughs> on my site, there you go, I'm sending a registration event. This is probably the key thing that allows you to separate your events out and uniquely identify them. Next thing, you kind of want to know when it happened. This is relatively useful for being able to kind of work out behavioural patterns over time and see if things are going up or down rather than looking at overall volume. And then probably the most, well, second most important part are these list of set of attributes that you're going to pass through. So all of these attributes allow you to segment your data in the future. So if you want to know what location people are on and, and break your analytics down by location, you're probably going to have to pass that through with your analytics data. If you want to know the screen size or the device type they're using, that should go through too. And in fact, all the different facets of the um, user or the thing that you're going to need, you can pass through your event that allows you to have more detailed segmentation in the future. So when you're planning um, what you're going to track and how you're going to track it, it's worth taking these things into account to know whether you can segment your audience correctly and actually drill down into the data you want. So the next one is analytic systems architecture. This is a broad brush kind of... Uh, diagram here. It doesn't go into the finite detail, but most analytic systems work in this way. I should know because I've built a few myself. So first thing you start off with is a tracker. This is the code that actually sits on your site itself. It can be JavaScript and run client side, but it can also run server side if you want. You're not restricted to just sending analytics data from <coughs> your web page. The next thing is a collector. So this is the actual endpoint and the thing that is actually consuming the data you pass to it. So you're sending HTTP requests most often um, across the wire to some system that's actually collecting this data for you. So generally a HTTP endpoint. And that collector's job is generally to push that data into a database. Um, you can do more fancy jiggery pokery if you need to modify your data any bit. But basically, once it's been collected, it is then stored in a database. You can use lots of different types of databases to do that. You're not kind of just restricted to using um, SQL-based <coughs> databases. Um, and then on top of that system, you have your dashboards. So basically, this is how you can visualize your data and interpret your data and redo this. Um, depending on what you're doing, we'll go into slightly more detail in a second, you can do this in other ways. But this is basically how it works. This is the code you put on your site for Google Analytics, and this is what happens when you go to analytics.google.com. There you go. Finally, A-B testing. This is something that we use extensively at The Guardian um, to do hypothesis testing. So when you're testing something, you don't just want to put it out there and go, did it work? That is one way. That's just A testing, where you just put it out and go, did it work? Um, but sometimes you want to control group, so you want to see, is it actually doing better than what's happening at the moment, or is it doing worse? And sometimes you want to be able to test multiple things at once. So you may have a few different variations on this idea that you're pushing out there. Um, most A-B testing outputs look something like this. So I think this was for... I can't even remember now. I think it was for people registering on the site. We had a few different flows that they could go through. You can see that we have divided up the segments across here. So this is variant A and variant B. A was probably a control variant in this time. We can see over time, this was the number of site registrations we had through each process. Um, and then you can kind of look overall to see if one of them was better than the other. This is generally a lot easier to understand when you just look at 
the data at the end. So you can say, I ran this test for two weeks. The total number of page views on the control segment here was 1.5 million. This is how many people clicked on the thing I wanted. Um, that was the click-through rate. And that's what CTR stands for. Um, that's, that's my baseline. And then the two variants I ran, A and well, one and two in this scenario. You can see the first one actually performed worse. So the click-through rate went down by 2.13%. Uh, and variant B, Shazam, it went up. Something has gone right here. So this was a good one. So this is the basics of A-B testing. You probably all knew that already there, right? Um, so when you're building your site or you're building your features, how do you work out what you want to track? Most people just dump the analytics on their page and then three months later someone says, so how did that go? And then they furiously dig through the analytics going, God, I can't make sense of this. I never thought about this from the beginning. So when I, I worked on the membership site for The Guardian for quite a long time. Um, when we started implementing tracking, um, I went through this process. So basically, from row two to 15 are the different things that can actually happen on the site. So someone can register as a user, they can, it also has events, you can buy tickets to stuff, they can buy a ticket, they can sign in, they can attend an event, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all the actual activities that can happen on the site. These are all the events that I'm gonna to send to my analytics system. And then everything here, and I couldn't fit this on, unfortunately this screen resolution is relatively low, but as we keep going down here, these are all the different attributes that I can pass through with this information. So if they're an attending an event, I could say when the event was, I could work out how in advance people are buying their tickets. All of this information is available with all these attributes that I pass through here. So this is an exercise you can do when you're like, how do I improve my tracking? Work out what people can do on your site and also work out what information you're gonna have about them at that time. Excellent. Onwards, onwards. So, analytic systems themselves. Um, I'm going to break them down into three sections. Um, the first one are the ones that we all know and love. Um, and generally, these are page view based tracking systems. So, Google Analytics and some company, well, we use Omnitry at The Guardian for some stuff. Um, these are tracking systems working in the way that I presented before. They are slightly page view biased, so, most of their tracking is done just using page views. That's their core first-class citizen. You can do other custom event tracking like button clicks and stuff like that. They don't always work quite as well as you hoped, but um, these things are pretty good. And the good thing is, is this stuff is free as well. So depending on your kind of site volume, you don't have to fork out loads of money. Um, but there you go. So page view based tracking systems. The next ones we have are more event based. So the event is the first-class citizen. There's no longer the separation of page views and clicks and all these things here. Um, and just do your mapping how we did before and pass events through. So I've used Mixpanel to note this is not an exhaustive list. There are hundreds of analytics systems out there. I didn't really want to list them all for you. Um, and then finally, you can also roll your own. So I've rolled my own analytics systems a few times. Um, the architecture is identical to as I showed before. Um, in terms of the databases you use, we use Elasticsearch quite a lot, so that's optimised for kind of storing analytics style data um, and can do really fast segmentation and bucketing um, multiple facets in a super fast way. Um, the Guardian, and I'm going to talk about this briefly, but it is really subject to its own presentation. We built our own analytics system called OFAM, tracks over 300 million unique events a day um, and stores this data and presents it back to users in real time. So we have some experience in building our analytics systems and pipelines. Um, the one I used on membership was actually an open source one called Snowplow. Um, this allows you to kind of set up your own tracker and collector. Um, it's mostly Scala based, but it has lots of different options for how you sort of stream your data through the systems and what data stores you put it on in the end. There you go. So here are some systems that we've built. So basically, this, I'm just going to show you some of the sort of dashboards and collection systems we've got and um, what they look like, and then I'm going to kind of go into why they were useful. Um, so the first one, um, this was for membership. So when I worked on membership, um, this, I set up this tracking system because I really wanted to be able to distill down the core information that I thought was useful for the developers and for the business itself to understand with what was going on. So if we look here, um, the core thing that people do in membership is they sign up and hopefully they give us money. Um, so over this side here, I can see this is how many people have signed up in the current time period. So I took this screenshot a couple of days ago. A um, couple of thousand supporters there, um, slightly less number of partners, and um, I didn't represent friends there because they don't give us money. Um, I can look at upgrades and downgrades over time to so see how many people move between tiers. Um, 
as we scroll down, we have even more information. This may be sensitive, by the way, so don't look too hard. Um, so this is the number of people that go to event registrations. This is the amount of revenue that we made. Um, this, is, this graph is a breakdown, again, of member acquisition over time, so I can see how it's working out. These are the different tiers of um, membership that you can sign up to, um, partners, patrons, and supporters. Um, so you can see the yellow ones, we get quite a lot of supporters, which is good. I can look at ticket sales over time, and then if I'm really excited, I can look at how our campaigns are doing. So we run a lot of marketing campaigns. This breaks down the number of people that have bought event tickets by the different campaign codes. And then similarly, the same for site registration, so I can see which ones are doing better over time. So that was for membership. That was just to kind of really help the team focus on what was useful. Um, you could get all this data out of Google Analytics just in the same way, but sometimes curating that information is key to getting people to focus on the right thing rather than getting them to drill into it themselves. The next one, after I left membership, I moved into the mainguardian.com site. Um, this is for email sending, so we send a lot of emails out, as you can imagine, um, and we really wanted to be able to track um, not only how many emails we're sending, but what the kind of click-through rates were like over the time, what the open rates were like over time, um, and also how these things work together. So we use a system called Exact Target, which is kind of owned by Salesforce nowadays. Um, that has some reporting in it, but this stuff isn't that good, and I could, we could get the data, but some guy was sitting there once a week pulling this stuff out and dumping it into a spreadsheet and then sending it around for everyone. And I was like, but I release a few times a day. I'm not going to wait a week to see how this thing impacted. So we basically scrape their API to get this data back and kind of, I think we scrape it once an hour. Um, we then push the data into DynamoDB, which is an Amazon thing, and then that, the dashboard is fed off that. But this allows us to get a good look into how our email stuff is going. So um, I think I have about seven or eight, whoops, that's the wrong button. Um, clicky, clicky, swipey, swipey. There you go, scroll. Good, so I click all the different emails that we send out, and I can see if they're growing over time and how the kind of click-through rate is going. Whew. This is thirdly, three finger swiping. So this final one is OFAN, um, and this is the real-time analytics tool we use for the journalists themselves. So the data isn't just for the business, it can actually reshape how you do your work. So basically every single article that The Guardian publishes, we publish about 400 articles a day. Um, the journalist that wrote it, and in fact anyone can get all near real-time feedback on how that article is performing. So I think there's about 15 second delay. Um, some people are upset about that. No, they're not really. Um, uh, so this is looking at this article about Tony Blair. Um, anyway, there you go. So you can see here how many page views it's had, the median attention time, so how long someone's spent on this article, um, kind of where it's, what social media sites it was promoted on. You can see since the article, from when the article was published, um, where the traffic came from in terms of referrer. So is it internal Guardian traffic from one of our front pages to this article? Um, has it come from Google, Facebook? Has it come from our apps, Twitter, Reddit, etc.? cetera? Um, then we can talk about where it's being read, so the locations, um, how people got to it, like or what browser they're using. Are they using desktops? Are they using phones, tablets, or our app? Um, what referral source they came from, how many people, how many days these people have visited the site, so how loyal the people that read this site were. Um, this is, they've visited one day in every seven, and the people at the end, they visit every single day. They really love The Guardian. Um, there you go, and you can see if people have watched videos, what people are saying about it on social media, etc., etc. So this is a vast amount of data and really can shape what people do so they can understand what's happening with the content that they've written. So data isn't just for your business people, it can also re change how you actually have do your day-to-day -day processes. Right, where are we? So, let's go back, I think I have a recap. What am I doing? No, that's not the right button. Okay, yep. So the recap, it's not how you collect your data, but what you do with it that counts. So the collection is just the beginning part of it. How you interpret the data, who you give it to, and how you get that to change your process is really key. So. We're nearing the end of the presentation, my guys. Well done for staying with me all this time. Um, the next one is, who is this information for? Well, it's actually for everybody. So raise your hands if you're a developer. How many developers? <sighs> Excellent. Anyone here a sort of product manager, product owner? Yes. Anyone own their own business or run their own business? There you go. Wonderful. So 
It's for all of you, everyone who put their hands up, and in fact, even the people that didn't, you all need this information. So, for developers, if you're releasing these features into production, how do you know if it, was, if it even worked? What was the point in you spending all of those hours crafting that code if it had no impact? And how can you use this information to re-evaluate how you do things next time? So, it helps you scope the features in a kind of narrow way. It helps you understand if they're being performant. And there you go, it gives you really good feedback. If you're a product manager or project manager, your neck is on the line. This is your job to make these things successful. So if you can't report back to your business quickly how th these things are doing, then really this, you're going to be in a bit of a pickle. Um, but it's extremely important that you can help set these metrics when you're looking at tasks and features that you want people to build and really understanding this kind of hypothesis-driven development approach. If you run your own business, the next time someone says, it's going to take me a few weeks to get the data, they are lying. 15 seconds it can go from them clicking that to presenting that back to you. So if you, need, if you aren't able to get the information you want, it's worth investing time and effort into putting systems in place to be able to collect the information and actually get the feedback you want to make the decisions to make your business more successful. Whew. There you go. Final part, final part. So where has this worked? talked about the virtues of this, so where have we actually used it day to day and kind of um, what are these things. So this process we use extensively at The Guardian. I can't think of a feature that I've released in, in production in at least the last year that hasn't gone through some type of testing first of all and hasn't had some type of hypothesis behind it so we can work out whether it's going to be successful or not. Um, so let me go through some swift case studies. Um, this first one is for when I worked on membership. So membership launched. Um, it launched with three different um, tiers that you could sign up to. The first one was free. We'll forget about those. You want the money. The second one, you'd um, sign up as a partner. I think you'd pay £15 a month to be a partner of The Guardian. You'd get <coughs> discounts for tickets. And then the third one was for people with top dollar. Um, that was to sign up to be a patron. And they were paying something like £60 a month. So we launched the site, in fact, prior to this over here sometime in uh, September, two years ago. Um, the site launched, two paying tiers. These things were going okay, but actually the acquisition rate was not as high as we'd hoped. Some bright spark was like, maybe it's too expensive. Who wants to spend 15 quid a month when they could probably spend less somewhere else? So the business had done a huge amount of research. They didn't just pluck these numbers from the air. They had some consultants doing reports and kind of doing market analysis and working out the actual value to do this. But the bright spark that said, let's make it slightly cheaper. There you go. People didn't really like that. They were like, no, we already have the data that we need. This, we don't think this is going to work. It's going to undermine our current, the people that have signed up. So do you know what? Rather than arguing our opinions against each other, we were like, well, do you know what? Let's just test it and see what the users say. And then it's no longer an opinion-based argument. It's actually factual. So around this period here in sort of March, we did some A-B testing. So we hacked together some minimal implementation of this, did some A-B testing, and you can see this green bar here, very small, is the number of partners we get signing up. The even smaller purple slither is the number of patrons. But the yellow here is the number of supporters we got signing up at that cheaper rate. So we gathered the data at this point in time, gave it back to the business. They were like, my god, maybe you're right. Maybe the research was wrong. So we then spent some more time hacking it all, not hacking together, polishing it, <laughs> making it better. Um, and then you can see from this point in time we released it. And look at that sea of yellow. Isn't that good? So it's, it's good to kind of make things factual rather than just opinion-based. Number two, this is email sign-up. So it's pretty hard to sign up to an email from The Guardian before we started working on it. It was something like a six-step registration process with an email validation bit at the end. Then you were automatically signed up to email list, and then changing your preferences was a nightmare. So another great idea, someone's like one-click email sign up. You just put your email address in a box and you press sign up and then it goes. My God, revolutionary. <laughs> so again, the business is like, but we need to get all these permissions. Blah, blah, blah. So we're like, do you know what? Let's run it as an A-B test. Yeah, oh, hacked it together again. Um, this is actually only came out of A-B testing maybe two weeks ago. So we actually ran this A-B test for almost two months. So it's not something you just run for a couple of weeks. You need to make sure you've got the right data. Um, but you can see once we found it, we had a real surge in number of signups. This is what it was like previously, hardly any. Um, and then since we launched this feature, 
We got a lot of people signing up. We, sh we showed that this was successful and people kind of bought into it. So, plus one for success. Um, thirdly, and I talked about this before, OFAN again, this has fundamentally changed how journalists, journalists at The Guardian do their work by being able to get the feedback for what their um, journalism is doing, what the articles they've written doing. They can really work out where they should be promoting it, whether they should be changing it, um, and doing those things here. So this article about chocolate bars that went out to a day or two ago, um, we can see by referrer here. So the most interesting part of this is um, this red bit here. So this red bit is when we sent out an app notification. So the article was literally released. No one really picked it up. It sent out an app notification. Boom, you can see suddenly in those preceding minutes, we had thousands of people doing that, and then it slowly tailed off over time. But if your analytics system isn't able to give you that feedback, how are you going to know what the impact is and how are you going to know where you should be doing this? So it really allows you to alter your processes and do things in a different way. So I did say I'll talk about when it, when it doesn't work. Um, sometimes you can get what's known as analysis paralysis, <laughs> where you, you can't collect the data that you want, so you can't make a decision. And sometimes you just have to go with your gut feeling. Sometimes you don't have enough data. You can't get a statistically significant sample of data to be able to make a a decision and this can actually sort of freeze what you're doing um, and yeah so these are these are times when you can't use it so this is just another tool for you to use to help move your business forward we have made it guys we are at conclusion time so this is what I want you to do when you go away today go back to your offices you need to look at your current project or your current feature set that you're working on number one work out what you're actually trying to do what's the hypothesis if your boss doesn't know or your clients don't know, then spend the time actually getting to the heart of that. No more, just add the telephone number, Dom. You want to work out really what you're doing. So go home, look at all your projects and work out really what you're trying to do. The next thing is how are you then going to track that change? Do you have the systems in place to know when you have been successful and when you've actually reached your goal? Finally, no longer these sort of huge polished chunks of code where you made everything super duper. You need to do the minimum thing possible to be able to test this hypothesis. Only once you've proven that the code you have written is valuable should you be bothering to do any refactoring or making it any better. Otherwise, you're just wasting time and effort on the wrong things. And finally, look at your current processes. What are you doing as a team and what are you doing as a business? And are you able, what do you need to do to put analytics at the heart of your processes? The benefits are clear. Less time wasted, more money saved. Um, and there you go. As a final thought, um, we looked at that stuff on membership before. Um, I was working after we'd kind of released all this stuff about the supporter tier. They were still <coughs> clinging on. They wanted the partner tier to do well. And they decided we're going to add a few more features. So they wanted to give free tickets to people that signed up and free books if they, if they wanted. Um, this was a kind of unproven idea. They thought it would be good. This is what people want to sign up. Um, but they were so gung-ho about it, they were willing to get hundreds of thousands of pounds of marketing money on this feature. They were like, it's going to be a success, Dom. Do not worry. We've got it all under control. They had not done any testing and anything like this. So I was like, the alarm bells are ringing. Don't feel comfortable with this. I pushed back and said, you know what? We won't spend the money yet. Let's fine. We'll spend some time doing the work, but let's test it first, see what the user feedback is, and then we'll do the marketing spend afterwards. Lo and behold, the feature was a flop. Nobody wanted, to, wanted these features and it didn't really increase acquisition at all. And we would have thrown all of that money away because somebody thought it was a good idea rather than realising that it was an actual fact. So, if you want to come and work in an exciting world like this, we are hiring. Um, but that concludes my presentation. There you go. Does anybody have any questions? I'll start here. Just thinking about the volume of analytics you collect. Mm -hmm. It could be that at the Guardian, you, you know, you've got all these articles and you must be publishing so many hundreds and thousands over the years and so on. How do you manage that volume in terms of what to necessarily do you like drill into things from a high level to a mid to a low level to get to details? How do you know what to focus on? How do you know what to ignore? How do you target that bit? Do you kind of set up like um, intelligent alert sort of thing? So do you want to know about user registration suddenly shooting right up or dropping right off and, and 
and that sort of thing. It's only kind of get to a point of managing, so it's a volume mm -hmm. and yeah. Very good, very good question. So we do it in, in multiple ways. We have different teams and different systems that put these into place. So um, one of the first things is actually collecting that data in the first place. So the interesting thing about OFAN is because we have such a huge volume of traffic, we can only store the data in OFAN for two weeks. So we don't have years of historical data in that system in real time because the size of the cluster to store that data and actually give you meaningful results would be too high. So that tool is just for short-term turnaround. Um, we have a lot of, so we have quite, a, we have about 120 people in our development department, about 65 developers. So each team are kind of focused on their different areas. So there'll be a team that's focused on registration, a team that's focused on um, onward journeys from articles and things like that. So you, we split it up by having people focus on different bits. Um, in terms of the longer term data analysis, we do have a data warehouse, and we have moving into data lake technology at the moment. Um, so we store a lot of all of this long-term data for broader analysis as well. Um, we have data scientists that work for us too. We have a couple of them, um, and their job is to do look at um, trend analysis and also answer specific questions. So if you see anomalies in data or if somebody wants to ask a question, we have people that kind of do that. So. Um, it's taken a long time to get there. We've had to invest a lot of time and effort in to do that, but it, it kind of helped. Does that answer your question? Yeah, you answer the volume of with the volume of people. <laughs> yeah, they, there you go. Yeah, so it's, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's a big problem, and, and there's huge amounts that we don't know. Oh, you talked about intelligent alerts. Um, so one of the good things about um, OFAN is that it puts your data into a stream, so you can fork the data into different locations. Um, we've recently been experimenting um, with machine learning systems um, and f f recommendation engines and things like that. So there is some algorithmic stuff you can do against that data as well that's going to automate some of those things. So you can pump in the data for what types of users view what types of articles, maybe recommend them better articles or things like that. So, so you're very much building a very bespoke system to do all of these things. Yeah, yeah. So, so, <coughs> so. One of the key things is applying this to your domain. So our domain is specific. So we write articles and we write the news. And so what the data that we want is, is also very specific. So most analytics systems that you sign up for are, are built for broad cases. So they should, they're the kind of lowest common denominator for what you're trying to solve as a thing. So analytic, Google Analytics has great dashboards for all these different things. But does it allow you to put the nuance for your business to show what that thing is useful to you? And, and one of the things about being able to manage your data on your own or visualize your data is you can put that own emphasis on that so you don't have to go I'll click on this report here this x-axis shows blah and this y-axis shows this you can actually really represent that data back to people so they can make the right decisions so depending on on what you're doing um, it's depending on whether you should invest in this stuff but it's I mean, it's extremely valuable for us and um, if you can put just the basic processes of doing hypothesis driven development and proving these things are right that's that's a start but if you really want to grow your business um, and use data to support that, then that's you, you kind of have to invest. But a lot of these things are getting a lot easier. So we use uh, a lot of Amazon services, and they have a kind of machine learning as a service thing. Um, there's various systems that are doing that. So um, the reason we have a lot of these systems is that we probably slightly ahead of the curve in doing that. But what we have now, you can when OFAN was built, it's been around for about three years. It's now you can replicate that kind of system relatively easy with kind of off-the-shelf systems if you wanted. So the technology is catching up. It, it just depends where you want to be on that curve um, to get there. So yeah, lots of different systems for different jobs, and lots of people looking in different areas. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, do you uh, sometimes find that uh, having done your A/B testing, put it live, and the results just don't correlate? That is a very good question. I can't think of any examples, but I'm sure it's happened. And I think that's the thing about re-evaluating your features over time is that what was right at the point in time when you did that thing and what might, and how, like the market may have shifted over six months. So it's been able to not only track the feature as it goes into production, but see how it's performing over time. And, um, it, getting the sample rate right as well, I guess. Yeah, and so we're lucky because we have such high volume of data, sample rates are, are easy to get. Um, but the other, sometimes if you have really low sample rates, like when I was working on membership, we had the number of registrations per day was pretty low, so you might only get 10 or 15 a day. Um, so if you to get a statistically significant sample, you had to run an A-B test for a month. And that's, so it's better to just put the features out there and see what happens rather than try and wait to prove it. So this is the bit where sometimes this doesn't work. Um, but yeah, 
focusing on the key metrics for your business and the key metrics for the features you're building is, and tracking them over time, not just when you're putting the feature out there, is key to sort of keeping your systems healthy. Um, I'll go to the uh, yeah. Do you, uh, just as you have uh, journalists facing dashboards, do you have developers, do you use the same instrumentation to give developers feedback about the technical effect of their deployment in terms of performance or error rates? Yep, that's a good question. Um, we do. I didn't put that in this presentation because it was it was more of an agile one rather than a technical one. Um, but the irony is that the same technology that you all use for logging and log aggregation and things like this is exactly the same as the technology you use for analytics. Um, so yet we have deployment dashboards, we have system monitoring dashboards, we look at the CPU and disk space and uptime and all these things. We have dashboards for those as well. So um, yeah, I didn't I didn't talk about that here, but we have we kind of apply this across everything, so it's not just about how's the business doing, it's also about how the technical aspects of it are doing as well. But this is the interesting, the interesting part is that people, from an operations point of view, people are like, oh, uptime is king, but do you know what, sometimes if your site goes down but it doesn't affect your, your business, then I don't know, is that, is that a thing? So it's, it's all about balancing these things out and seeing what, what the cause and effect of, of changes are. But yeah, we have lots of internal dashboards for all those things too. Um, Question. In terms of the email success that you were yeah. referring to, if you went back to that graph, your suppliers are dropping off quite after the two months. I just wondered when you reevaluate that. This one here? Yeah, it started since two months, and now it's starting to drop off. Oh, this bit here, you mean? Yeah. The dashboard is so real time that that is the segment for the day when I took the thing. So this is 10 o'clock in the morning when no, one, no emails have been clicked on. This is a misleading graph. Um, <laughs> Such high fidelity. Well, yeah, Thank sorry. Yeah. That's what the graph should have looked like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any more questions? Um, yep. Right. Yeah, no, yeah. Yep. Right. Yeah, so you, this, this is providing such, so, right, so, such quick feedback for the content of the Guardian. Yeah. You know, 15 seconds as opposed to days and weeks before. Yeah. So, how has this information really changed the site and changed behavior? So, like six months ago, has it, you know, has it changed to now? What are the big changes? Yeah. Um, so, to be honest, I was not at the organisation before this system was in place. Um, but what I have seen over time, so how we curate the front pages and stuff, that ha they get real-time feedback about the popularity of each of those articles, so they can shuffle those things around. Um, but yeah, I think more and more <coughs> journalists are thinking about that. And it, it, it's not that everyone's sitting there like paying close attention, but um, it is changing how people think about this. Um, it's also slightly contentious as well. So should you be writing articles that get lots of clicks or should you be writing articles that um, are, are kind of ethically good? So this is, this is also a balance to it too. So it's not just about pure consumption. There are other debates to be had too. Um, who is next? Who is next? Yeah, the question is kind of linked to his and that you have all this data from past stories. Presumably a potential story you might based on that data, look at it to decide how popular you might expect it to be and then decide whether to drop it or So, not. success prediction of... Is there anything like that? Um, we are thinking about that. We are thinking about that. Um, we have, as I was saying, with the machine learning stuff, you don't have to do recommended content. You can also um, feed it the sample of raw data and say, based on those statistics and the time it's going to be launched and the content of the article, is it going to be successful? So, um, I don't think it's there yet and I think people would also be slightly angry about being having their editorial position dictated by an algorithm but it, it, it is possible I don't think we don't make we, well, not that I know of. Um, any more questions oh, please so the Guardian's recruiting I was reading something from Cooper Lomaz earlier today saying that some 40% of employees in our industry think there aren't there isn't enough resource in the company to do jobs that they want to do and you're using Agile, how do you convince your product managers that after you've developed this quick hack and you've got it into to your production system and it's gathering the data and you can prove that the idea, the hypothesis is, is valid, how do you convince them to allow you to go back and refactor that code later rather than moving on to the next hypothesis, which is really important to them? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Have a large stick. 
Um, no. So, so yeah, that's that's that's. So this is a key point. And if, if you're like a tech lead or if you're a senior developer, the key thing you have to balance is feature development versus um, system development, and and that is something you have to do regardless of the processes you use. So you need to be able to. One of the interesting things about kind of tech debt and being able to do these things is you need to be able to balance out the value that you're going to get by doing the refactoring versus the value of doing another feature. And is your system quality going to deteriorate so much over time because you've just focused on feature development that it's going to be unstable? Or are you able to find a balance between the two? So the uh, answer is you have to find a balance. Um, sometimes it is worth spending more time on a feature. Um, we have a pretty high standard of engineering ability in our organization. So um, people can, can refactor things and we kind of separate our architecture so it's not kind of monolithic and we have lots of small services so it's e it is easier to refactor things once they've worked um, so but yeah it's, it's all up to the sort of technical people in the team to, to be able to push back and do that so it's, it's a conversation okay. so you, you have the autonomy to, to say no one I actually want to do this I don't want to do the thing that you as a product manager are asking to do I want to spend some time doing this and you're, you're allowed to in your organisation yeah yeah, I mean it's, and as soon as your site goes down or you're unable to deploy, suddenly people are like, why isn't it working? And like, so, pe so because the organisation has its own internal development team and people have seen this happen, they understand the value of this kind of technical stuff. So it, and this is a struggle you're going to have all over the place, so it's, but it's worth showing the value and saying this is what's going to happen, this is how it could go wrong, and finding that balance. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Uh, any more questions? Ah, oh, yes, please. Have you noticed any negative behavioural changes by giving more real-time, more frequent analytics? For example, <coughs> um, the example you showed there where the journalists could see their, their article in real-time. Is it this temptation they could jump in there and change it? It's not quite getting the right number of hits. Uh, that's a good question. Um, so, negative. If it, uh, is there negative behaviour? I'm not hugely close to that area of that, so I don't see what people do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, probably negative is people don't look at the data, so they have the data and they don't know. I would say that's a negative thing. Um, it, I don't really think like people learning about SEO and they're learning about things that are going to make their article more successful. But again, it's that debate over whether, like, if it's not performing well, is it because of how you've written it or is it because of the, the subject matter or etc. So that that's the bit where there's tension in the kind of. Am I just going? Am I just writing clickbait, or am I writing something that's meaningful and, and do that? So I, I don't know if people like I'm kind of working on something for I, testing AB head, uh, headlines, using AB testing for that to see if writing different headlines is going to have an effect. But I don't know if people like rewrite their articles entirely if it doesn't get things. I think once it's out there, it's that's it. They've, they've nailed their colours to the mast. Um, but yeah, yeah, good question. Can you offset any of your costs to R and D research and development? Um, you can, so we do that quite a lot. The question was, can you offset this type of research against the R&D tax. tax thing that you get back from the government for doing R&D? So if you read through the criteria, a lot of this stuff, um, yeah, I can't remember because I didn't have to submit it for this, but I think you can, especially if you're doing bespoke um, <coughs> research for doing that. Yeah, R read the read the specification from the government though, because there are some grey areas where you can put a lot of effort into something and not get it back, but we have done in certain areas. Um, any more questions? Um, so you, you were saying that it should be about working towards a goal or a, or a specific mm. metric, mm -hmm. which is a good start, but how much autonomy do you have to push back if you think the metric is wrong? Mm -hmm. So an example would be um, the business requirement is, oh, we need to increase registrations, whereas you would say, maybe say, well, no, it's about engagement. So mm -hmm. you get those people signing up who never come back, that's pointless. Yeah. Do you have that, that autonomy as well to, to kind of push back? Yeah, good question. So in this hand, I have my technical stick, and then this hand, I have my data stick, and I hit them with that too. Um, no, extremely, extremely good point. Um, again, this is, this is the debate. So, um, like... On the email thing I worked on, they changed the metric a few times because they realised that, the, that getting people coming back to the site from email could only be affected by getting more people to sign up for email. Um, so a lot of our product managers are acutely aware of that, and it's, it's not like you just spend five minutes, oh, this is the metric, off you go, six months of development work. Like you, you're constantly rethinking this, and, and your metrics can change over time. So you could have focused on one thing, realised that it wasn't any good, and then you moved on to something else. So, um, But by... 
letting everyone know what those things are and making everyone share that same goal allows everyone to think about it. So if it's if you say, yeah, new registrations versus actual engagement, you can have that debate and you can talk about it openly. So a lot of this is about honesty and being able to own the problem you're trying to solve rather than just implementing someone else's solution. So re-evaluate those things often, but let everyone know so they can give you feedback and you can work those things out. Wonderful. Any more questions? Yes. Have you ever had to develop testing strategies or maybe how would you develop a testing strategy for systems that you can't be rolling out into production like on a such a frequent basis like uh, a website say uh, your client base is you've got a wide on-prem client base yeah what kind of testing strategy would you think is would you use for that and um, you mean in terms of like functionally testing your code for deployment no, so in terms of sort of getting getting this this idea of testing your hypotheses okay um, what is, is is it would you think it's worthwhile doing that or, or would you focus more on the feedback you're getting on use of features. Um, so, so is the problem that you can't deploy fast enough to make the changes? Uh, so sort if, of, yeah. If you can only deploy every three months, how do you how do you do that? Yeah, and will everybody take the update kind of thing? That, that kind of question. Um, this is the problem with long deployment cycles. You have to get it right in for that release. So maybe you'd err on the side of caution and try and collect more as much data as possible because you knew, know you can't change it. Um, that would sort of be my advice. Yeah, if you can only update your code every three months, you're not really going to be able to operate in an agile way. What you're going to, I mean, so another approach is to have something like a beta program or an alpha program that isn't against your production systems, um, but you can get a, a sort of panel on audience or some other set of people to sign up so you can test those features. So if you can't test in production, try and test somewhere else. So a representative sample somewhere else is better than, no, than nothing at all. So um, we do that a lot with iPhone, actually. So um, iPhone has kind of its, its own release window. Um, we have an alpha program for people that can download the app and test it in that so it doesn't go through the app store. So if you can't control that bit, try and do it somewhere else. Yeah. Any more questions? Wonderful. Well, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. <laughs>